Now, I know that many of you are gonna watch this video before we've had class and actually done the exercise that I'm gonna be talking about. So there may be things here that don't make a huge amount of sense, but ideally the high order message, which is that we have system calls that allow parents to wait on children will be pretty straightforward. The exercise that you probably haven't done yet is that we're going to have you implement what I call a baby shell. So the shell is the program that runs at the terminal window when you type into it. And what that shell really does is you type something in and it says, oh, I need to create a process to execute the command that you typed in. And so in class, we'll show you how to do that and you'll actually get to build your own baby shell with only a few lines of code, which is kind of fun. But one of the things that will happen when you run your shell is that you'll see that, that the shell program, which is going to be the parent and the child process, which is going to execute the command that you type, like they might scribble all over each other on the screen and their output will be confused. And the question is, well, that's pretty ugly and the real shell doesn't do that. So how do we fix that? And the answer is that there are a couple of handy system calls that let a process wait on another process, typically a parent waiting on a child. And so I just wanna introduce those system calls to you. So there's a generic call called wait, and then a more specific call called wait pid. In many cases, I find wait pid easier to use, but they're very similar. And if you look at the man pages for these things, which I encourage you to do, you will see that there are all sorts of variations. So at a high level, what the wait system call does is it says, stop the process that issues the call until one of its children terminates and then return control back to the parent. And in the status location argument, return the exit code from the child. So this is gonna let a parent spawn a child process, wait for that process, and then see what the process did. Did it exit successfully? Did it not exit successfully? Wait PID is a way that we can wait for a specific process if we so choose. And depending on what you specify for this PID parameter, you can wait on any process or a specific process. Again, we will get the return value from the terminating process, so we'll know what it exited. So if you've written programs, you might notice that sometimes you can say like exit zero or exit one. And what that does is that says when this process exits, its exit status is this value. And we can return that value to a process that's waiting on it. So we can know whether whatever we asked the child to do successfully completed or not. The last parameter in wait PID lets you specify some options. And the option I wanna talk about here is one that determines whether the parent is going to wait for the child to terminate or only wants to check to see if a child has already terminated. Let's look at this in a little more detail. Wait PID gives us two different modes. The first mode where you don't specify anything option is what's called a blocking call because what we're gonna do is we're gonna block the calling process and say you don't make any forward progress until something else happens. And in this case, the something else is that the child process exits. However, you can specify this option no hang. And what that says is check to see if a process has exited one of your children. And if it hasn't, just return immediately. And so this gives us two very different modes of waiting on child processes. So there's something we call blocking wait PID, right? Or a blocking mode where we just say, I'm gonna wait. And I'm going to sit here and I'm not going to do anything else until that child process terminates. Well, that could be a problem if the child process has an infinite loop in it, right? You may have experienced this on Prairie Learn, where if you wrote a program with an infinite loop, it actually took a long time to finish because someone was waiting on it. And the only reason it ever returned is because we have a timeout that says, if nobody returns after a certain amount of time, we're just going to shut everything down. Okay, so that's called a blocking structure. In contrast, if we call wait PID with no hang, we can put it in the loop and say, has my child terminated? Has my child terminated? Has my child terminated? We can keep checking. And that's what we call polling. And one question I wanna ask you is, is one of these approaches better than the other? Is it obvious that one's better or are there different situations when one is better? Now you might think polling is really dumb. Like why should I keep checking if in fact I can just pause and wait? And in fact, blocking makes a lot of sense when the event on which we're waiting probably hasn't happened yet. And 
it's going to take me a while for, you know, for that event to happen. In contrast, if the event has almost always happened and it's a very rapid event, then sometimes polling actually makes more sense because the process of going to sleep and then waking back up can actually take some time. And so if these things are happening like really, really quickly, polling might be a better solution. So it's one of these cases where it's not an obvious answer and there are some trade-offs to consider. So in general, blocking avoids wasted work, right? I go to sleep, I wait, I don't do anything. However, blocking can have problems. So as I said, blocking is actually a kind of slow process in many cases. And secondly, there can often be atomicity problems. Now, wait pit is written to avoid those problems, but in a general solution with blocking, you might have the problem that you check if the event hasn't happened yet, and you say, okay, so I'm gonna block and wait for the event to happen. But as you all know from all the synchronization work you did in 213, if the event happens between the time I check and the time I issue this blocking call, it's possible that I might wait forever for an event that has already happened in the past. So you have to be careful when you're using a blocking protocol to make sure that you're not prone to this particular race condition. Sometimes polling can actually be more responsive. So I said that blocking can be a slow operation. And if it takes me longer to actually do that blocking than for the event that I'm waiting on to happen, then polling might actually be a better solution. So for example, if I am a very heavily loaded server process, and I'm expecting requests to be coming in constantly, it is almost always the case that it's more efficient to poll. And this trade-off between polling and blocking has been with us since for a long, long time, and there still are no clear solutions. So there are papers being published like right now talking about better approaches at making this trade-off or going seamlessly between these two different approaches, depending on how busy the system is. Another term you might hear when we talk about polling is called busy waiting, which is that we are actually using the processor and keeping it busy while we wait, right? Because every time we're asking, are you there yet? Are you there yet? I also like to think of polling as the three-year-old solution, right? If you've ever gone on a trip with a small child, you know, are we there yet? Are we there yet? This is the same thing. Has the event happened yet? And in general, we try to avoid busy waiting. Like I said, there are cases, however, where this kind of polling is not so much busy waiting, it's responsiveness. It's letting you get to requests really, really quickly that you might not be able to do if you had to first block and then wake up. We'll explore this a little bit more in class. <laughs>